Just a little over a year ago here in southwestern Oregon, we had a 50-year snow event, the kind of snowfall that happens maybe once in a lifetime. Not only was it a big, heavy snow event, but it followed two days of pounding rain, and it seemed like every tree in the county fell over on a power line or across a shop. Now, that's an exaggeration, but one of our local power providers lost 90% of their transmission lines. So here we are one year later facing a completely different kind of disruption, a pandemic, where it's not just Southern Oregon, but it is essentially, right now, most of the world. How about that? I read about these things, but I never thought that it would actually happen. Now, when it was snow on the ground, it was somehow less daunting, right? At least for us, because I had a generator and we had enough heat and we had what we needed because we live lives where we concentrate on being self-reliant, which by the way, I hope everyone concentrates on a little more when we get to the other side of the Corona event. Self-reliance is a good thing, as much as we can in an interdependent 21st century world, right? So in this coronavirus pandemic event, I don't have any special expertise or experience or news. All I have is a blue collar, mostly rural upbringing that has taught me to be as prepared as I can be, to look out for my neighbors as much as I can, and to think about self-reliance before self-reliance becomes really important. That's all I've got. The rest of this episode is a recording of a conversation Nate and I just finished up about COVID-19 and uh, sort of living in a dynamic environment where every time you tune into the news, you learn something different and you realize that maybe you're not as ready for this as you thought you were. We hope this doesn't sound dark and it doesn't need to sound dark because, you know, like Marcus Aurelius would say, that whatever the challenges of tomorrow are, we're going to face them with the same abilities and the same mindset and the same intelligence and the same resource that we've used to face every crisis before that. I learned a lot about that in that snowstorm. I learned that even though I thought I was fairly prepared, there were things that I had forgotten. And even though I hadn't thought about that particular event, other preparations I had made were useful. I learned that my neighbors were helpful and they were people I could help. I'm glad to be in the same community with Nate and his people. I'm thankful for my family, I'm thankful for a little bit of preparation, and I'm thankful to know that most of the time, the people across the street are gonna be helpful. And a lot of the time, the people across the street are gonna be people that can use your help. Check out our conversation. We're learning a lot, we all have a lot to learn, and the best way to do that is to keep your eyes and ears and mind wide open. Welcome to the Essential Craftsman Podcast. I'm Nate. I've got my dad here, the Essential Craftsman. How are you doing? Howdy. Glad to be here. We're going we're gonna to do our best to talk about coronavirus and the effect it's having on our lives and just the way that we are thinking about it. And it'll probably change tomorrow. It, it, it's, every day of the last three weeks has been a new revelations, new studies, new information. So yeah. Yeah. In fact, it'll certainly change tomorrow. I know I felt differently yesterday than I do today, and I think I felt differently the day before that. So I, I think I should expect that tomorrow, what we say here may be obsolete, but here we go, right? So generally speaking, are you are you concerned or is it just the flu and are you blowing it off? So I started out thinking, you know, looking at the mortality and contagion um, numbers and thinking, well, you know, it's a lot worse than the flu, but, you know, it's not. It's not orders of magnitude worse than the flu. And then I watched the numbers kind of change and morph and began to think about the contagion thing and the fact that I didn't understand any of it as a carpenter and a blacksmith. And, mm -hmm. you know, after talking to you and other people that, that I trust, I thought, you know, I need, to, I need to shake off the macho thing. This is not about getting up on a roof without a rope and because that's how I always did it. This is about taking a hard look at what it might actually be like for our community and maybe maybe take, adopting a different posture. So I've changed my posture. It is so hard to know. We're just used to so much information, all of it conflicting, all of it like 100% confidence from different sides. Yeah, and yeah. It, it is so hard to know who to believe, what's true, what's not, what you can just brush off. Yeah. It's so hard. So, you know, to that, I heard somebody, I don't, don't remember who it was last night, I was listening to someone saying that certainty 
and wisdom are almost mutually exclusive. Now, that's not the way he said it, but that when someone is approaching something that is relatively unknown or new or really large, if the topic is large and they're coming at it with certainty, huh, that indicates a certain lack of wisdom. Yeah. And boy, that sure seems <laughs> true to me with this, that every voice that is not interested in learning anything new probably is not the voice to listen to. Yeah, that's right. And that's especially true as as it unfolds and we have a lot more information now. People who are maybe sticking to a line of thought they had weeks ago is sort of like, you, you wonder if that person's more committed to yeah. proving a point than to um, looking at the facts and getting you know the the actual truth of the matter yeah. out on the table for sure. So what what we thought we would do is I've got six not questions but recurring thoughts or comments or text messages that I've received from friends and family, basically six different takes about this. Mm -hmm. And it's not that certain ones are right and certain ones are wrong. I think lots of these are all true, mm -hmm. but they're all really important. The first one we just mentioned, it's just the flu. Mm -hmm. I think we can safely say that it's not. It's not in both directions. It's not the flu that we're used to, and it's also not the Spanish flu. I mean, the yeah. Spanish flu in, what was it, 1918 or 1919, that was a serious disease. It would kill people, they say, within hours, including people in their prime. Yeah. And so this is not that, but this is also not the flu that we go in every fall as an old person and get a shot for. This is something much more serious or yeah. potentially serious than that. And the flu doesn't put San Francisco on lockdown. The flu right. doesn't shut down the NBA season and every school. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's every school in the nation. I know in Oregon, it's growing shut down. Yeah. So it's not <laughs> separate from the virus itself. The, the panic the reaction mm -hmm. it's something different and so yeah it's not and, the flu and so that's an excellent point that there are two different dynamics here there's the the illness the virus and its effects on human physiology and there's the fact that it's showing up in 2020 when everywhere we go the mantra is always safety first and the way that society is going to react to this is its own threat or yeah. can be which ha is a threat that exists because of a desire to do a good thing but it's still a threat yeah um I've got a lot of comments and texts from friends who are acting more concerned about the panic than the the virus. And I think that's fair. Fair enough. <laughs> panic yeah. is really scary. We don't it live is. in a big city, but I, I would be kind of scared if I was downtown in a huge city. And I, I don't know that. I, I, a lot of you listeners may be, but Certainly I don't are. know. It seems like panic, people can do some crazy things. So I I don't think there's reports of riots or looting or I haven't heard anything like that. Big like violent break in. So I don't think we're at that point. I don't know. I don't think we'll get to that point. I don't think we're getting to that point. Our supply chain is intact. Yeah. Warehouses are bulging with food. I mean I mean, a month ago nobody was worried about toilet paper, which means there was a lot of toilet paper on the ground in the supply chain and it's still there. And the stuff that's not in the supply chain is in our cupboards, and so this is not we don't yeah. have a shortage, but we're definitely in a different place. Yeah, but the, the panic aspect is it's fair to be concerned about people mm -hmm. overreacting to this because I think so. It, it certainly could happen. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, on our main channel, you, you already heard about this uh, snowstorm that happened a year ago. But for you podcast listeners, we'll just catch you up real quick. A year ago in Roseburg, there was a snow event that shut down town for how long? Give them like the quick Reader's Digest version. It, it was a 50-year snow event where we had two days of soaking rain, and then it started snowing one afternoon, a super wet snow on the ground. It was all soaked up, and the trees by the millions, that's not the smallest exaggeration, just went to the ground around here. You could just hear them hitting the ground and branches breaking off. We have one little rural electric company in North Douglas County, Douglas Rural, Douglas Co-op. It's a. It started out as a cooperative to get power out into the hinterland, right, where the population almost wouldn't support it on a profitable basis. Anyway, 90%, 90% of their power lines were on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so that was an emergency because, for instance, Cy and Maxine are serviced by that company, and they were without power for three or three and a half weeks. That's a long time when there's snow on the ground not to have the power on. So if you're watch the video if you're listening to this because we have some footage of that, and I bring it up again because – that was a much different front line yeah. than what this crisis is, yeah. well, than what the front line of this crisis is. I, I don't think, I'm not worried about the power grid or the gas stations 
right. or food. Right. I'm worried about, I've got a brother-in-law who's a nurse. Yeah. And I've got a father-in-law now and two grand, three grandparents who are over 80 years old. That's right. A couple and, of them compromised, really compromised. And I am worried about them. Yeah, for so sure. So it's a different front line. And, yeah. and, and the families of our medical community who oh. have to deal with their fam- their family members working around the clock. So yeah. That and, hasn't happened yet, but that's the... And the people we know and love, like your brother-in-law, who are in the healthcare industry, who are just about to have a really long, grueling shift in a pretty dangerous environment that they'd have to work yeah. through. Now, having said that, something we talked about earlier, we have to acknowledge, when we talk about this, we're out of our lane. Yeah. When we bring an, when we bring an opinion about an event or contagion or treatment or economies, we are out of our lane. And that feels a little shaky, doesn't it? Yeah. It, that's why we wanted to do it this way. So you get the feeling that this is the conversation that we would be having, whether the camera was rolling or not. This yeah. is These are the thoughts and ideas that are going through our head. And so it, it felt like in some ways we had an obligation to acknowledge it. We have a bunch of videos ready to come out and it was feeling a little silly to like put them up right yeah. now, yeah. knowing that a lot of you are going through some extremely stressful yeah. and weird yeah. times. Yeah, a lot of you are feeling things right now that you maybe have never felt before, apprehension and insecurity. Uh, and I am as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nuts. So we, and you should know this as well, um, my dad and I are both extremely paranoid, even among our family. We, we are on the, on the outer edge, the, you know, the lunatic fringe, the wide fringe of paranoid people. So for us, this is, um, you know, yeah, we've thought, we've thought about these things before, but it's still strange to be experiencing it. Yeah, it All is. Right. So a couple other of these comments I'm getting here. Um, I, <laughs> I haven't seen this comment, but I've, I saw it on Twitter a lot. I've been prepping for years. Bring it on. <laughs> so th- that's a juvenile attitude, right? I mean, it's not so self-reliance is important to me. And like you just mentioned, it's important to us. And I feel like self-reliance is at least a gentler way to say prepared than to say I'm a prepper. But I think it also indicates a different mindset mm-hmm. that you're not you're not for so we just came out of the the snow uh, snowmageddon right and in the, at that at that what you what you call it a battle line um the front line front line yeah on that front line the fact that i had a generator and some gas was really a good thing on this front line i hadn't really thought of this about how to to voluntarily quarantine and keep little people entertained and not have everybody climbing the walls yeah and how do you decide which of your own children and their families to interact with in order to keep grandpa um, minimally exposed. And so it has shifted and self-reliance or prepping, you know, I'm a prepper, bring it on. You don't bring on a situation where you have to be concerned about the health of the 85 year old people that are in your care. Yeah. You know, you can only think about prepping in terms of sort of a selfish me first sort of an attitude. And that, that's not what I don't, I, that's no good. It's just no good. Yeah. Even if self-reliance is good, I've been prepping for years, bring it on, is uh, living the life of an animal where all you're concerned about is your welfare, yeah. your health, your strength, your food. Ah, okay, I get that, but not for me, thanks. Yeah, I, I'm I'm scared of those people who have that mm-hmm. mindset because, yeah. Um, yeah, we're all kind of in the same boat. <laughs> we're in the same boat. Regardless That's right. of what your pantry looks like. It, That's right. We are still in the same boat here. That's and, right. And it's possible that life isn't going to look the same going forward That's regardless right. of what your prepping situation was now That's that right. next comment and this actually was a text from a, a really close friend you can't live scared whatever's going to happen is going to happen just go about business as usual there are worse things that can happen than you get sick from some virus i guess that's kind of the same as the it's just the flu mindset it is and i i hope that this has been kind of discredited now the um the impact to the market alone shows you that yeah, it is worse than getting sick from some virus. It's our et- entire economy yep. um, imploding. And you can't go about business as usual because yeah. business is not going to go about <laughs> business as usual. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and it, I mean, situational awareness, right? I mean, situational awareness, whether it's in social interaction or if you're if you're walking down a deserted street at night and you hear someone walk, whatever it is, situational awareness is important, including now. Yeah. And, and you can't draw all your situational awareness from the nightly news, but you have to, you have to be, you can't go about business as usual. Yeah. 
Um, okay, I, I heard this from uh, some family this weekend, and I thought it was interesting. We should be doing what the UK is doing and shoot for herd immunity. Quarantine the old folks and let it run through everyone else. Hmm. I have no opinion. I don't understand it. I, I'm not a. Yeah. I'm not an epidemiologist. I don't know. Does that work? Is that a possibility? I don't know. Um, I don't even know if that's what the UK is doing or not. But it's amazing how different countries are. If that is the case, are taking completely different. You know, I heard a reference on some talking head that I walked by a television screen somewhere talking about that the UK was was anticipating herd immunity, and I thought, huh, herd immunity. Okay. What, is it, what does that even mean? I, I don't know. I did see a report or a headline that talked about people in China, I think, who had contracted it multiple times. Whoops. So I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I don't know if we know enough about this virus yet to make assumptions like that. Yeah. I don't know. That would, maybe that's a good strategy. Either way, probably make sure your older parents and grandparents are safe so the, and inside and drop their there's food off. The take e- there's the takeaway. There's the either way. <laughs> Take care of your old folks. So when you're worried about yourself and your kids, as you should be, call your mom, right? Find out what's going on there. And if you're lucky enough, like I am, to live close to two sets of parents, do I need to, I don't need to say this. Take responsibility for your people, for the most vulnerable among us. And maybe that's an old person that lives across the street. Take some responsibility for them, right? I mean, maybe their kids are are removed by distance and maybe by emotional distance, which is a much more, it's a longer distance. Emotional distance is longer than any geographical distance. But anyhow, take some responsibility for those old yeah. people. I've heard that the mortality rate among those, particularly those who have a compromised system, can get up into the 14 15%. Wow. That's way worse than a flu. Yeah, I would not want to take those odds Mm-mm. with someone I no, care about. thank you. So if you're going to the store, check with your neighbor, can, elder your neighbor. neighbor. Can I bring you something that you need anything I, yeah. i'll pick it up for you if you're a younger healthy person who's yep. doing that type of thing help yep. your help your neighbors and communities and how about this don't wait till you're going to the store maybe you go over there and say hey would it help you if i went to the store yeah i mean if if there's a time to think about the efficacy of the golden rule this is it yeah you know the whole notion about doing for other people what you would really like somebody to do for your folks or for you yeah that's the way out of this Next regularly occurring comment I see. It's the government seizing liberties and expanding reach that we should actually be worried about here. Well, uh, that would definitely not be wrong. <laughs> maybe, maybe that, but put it, let's put it on the list. Let's not make that the exclusive thing. It's okay? maybe we should also yeah. be worried about here. <laughs> yeah. After we figure out what our self-reliance looks like and what our neighbor's welfare looks like, then maybe that would be something that we would spend some time talking about. But yeah. not not today, right? But there's certainly no doubt. You think the last big event like this, and the only one, actually two. I, in my lifetime, it was 9-11. I was 19. And the 2008 market crash that were real, like, whoa, history. And um, after both of those <laughs> major mm-hmm. new government uh, programs mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and... Um, that that have had their own like you know decades of impact so Mm -hmm. i think we could certainly expect more of the same after this so Mm -hmm. that's probably a valid concern all right next comment here the real and this is the last one i've got on our list the real concern is the market crashing and the effect on the economy this will end many more lives than coronavirus okay so i i heard a thing last night and it was beautifully articulated that we have two entirely valid concerns that are intention, that are opposing each other. And one is the concern about health and life, okay? Everybody has that concern. The other is the concern about the health and vitality of the economy. And some people have that concern more than others. But even though these two things are in opposition, we have to figure out some way to find out where they connect. And there has to be enough wisdom somewhere to understand how the choices to support one will negatively impact the choices to support the other, going both ways. And what that boils down to is something, as I understand it, called statistical homicide, where there are policies and decisions relative to standard of living and uh, 
access to health care and nutrition and hygiene and transportation and education and all these things that are social choices that are made um, both at the government level and at the individual level. But at the policy level, mm -hmm. there are choices that can be made there that either intentionally or unintentionally lower standards of living to where people's personal behavior tend to towards less towards health and more towards sickness less towards safety and more towards risk less towards um uh stability and more towards instability and those things can happen because of choices that were made to affect other good things and you can't see the deaths that occur except until you look at it in the statistical format and then those numbers spread out across the population can add up to great much greater loss of life than the individual cases that you can see in a hospital bed as a result of an accident or a virus. Mm -hmm. And I think it's real. Statistical homicide, I think, is entirely real. And people don't think about it. I mean, what's that famous quote? I think it was Marx or Lenin or somebody that the death of one is a tragedy. The death of a million is a statistic. Yeah, That's what we're talking about. This is another one that this can also be true, or maybe we should also be concerned about the economic impacts of this have to be uh, airline industries shutting down restaurants obliterated you know if if i don't know the numbers but if only you know one out of 10 businesses survive anyways and a lot of businesses are operating on very thin margins tight um something like this can <laughs> it's, it's 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 a deal killer and then the, the personal impact you know people's marriages and relationships with their families and yep. their mental health the, it can really, truly, uh, an, an economic crisis has very tangible yep. effects on the world and on our communities and on ourselves. And I think we should definitely be concerned about a, an economic downturn. Can't disregard that. I mean, yeah. uh, so 2008, 2009 was an economic catastrophe for me, uh, contractor, Pacific Northwest. Um, and so having sampled that, in when I was still in what should have been very produ a very productive period of my life, I have a much more profound dread now of deep recession than I did before. Yeah. The world has gone through a lot of hard times before. One of the last ones that's talked about a lot in the United States is World War II, yeah. where when that the whole world now it, obviously it's a world war so it wasn't yeah. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. unique to us yeah and we had it much much easier than much than easier lots of other places but when that happened it was expected or at least the way it worked was women went into the workforce to build mm. armaments and weaponry and obviously the dads and men went to war and it was a huge sacrifice it, life changed big time there wasn't an expectation for bailouts or yeah this shouldn't affect my yeah standard of living it was kind of like everybody knew this is gonna be a new this is a new time and it was and it's i think it would be a mistake to think that we should be able to go through something like this without any impact on our yeah. selves so so let, let's just reiterate that we are out of our lane here i mean we are not political commentators we're not historians but we are lower middle class people blue collar yeah. people grappling with the changes that have been brought to our doorstep and our community by this by this coronavirus from a certain perspective i hope to use this to cement my family even tighter together you know even if we do one or in fact let me tell you this my son-in-law ben who lives north of here a couple hours has pneumonia right now now, he's been tested, and he's been waiting to hear back from the test, and it does not seem likely to him or anyone else that it is um, COVID-19 caused. But still, the young man's sick, and he has a house full of kids. And so when we're on the other side of this, I am going to be less, I'm going to feel less entitled to having a family that is always healthy and to having circumstances always gentle. And maybe I'll be more tuned in to yeah. to some of the better responses that can come from that. Yeah. Um, another one of the front lines of this situation that is very real to me is parents with young kids because it is not easy to be cooped up in your house <laughs> with young kids. And uh, wow. Yeah. Moms and dads who are now having to entertain um, those guys 24-7, that's, that's going to be a source of stress and I, I'm trying to, my wife, Allie and I are trying to just get
get our expectations and do some deep breathing like okay we can do this and it's gonna be <laughs> tough and we yeah. and so oh and i'm loving life as a grandparent right now yeah. <laughs> see ya okay it's good so there was a funny facebook post that kelly read to me last night and i won't get it right but it was something like i've homeschooled for exactly eight hours and 11 minutes today because my kid's school is closed and i now know that teachers should make a billion dollars a year it's hard to have this conversation and not have it come across as scary and negative and I don't know what to quite to say about that uh, aside from that's just, uh, I don't know, this is a little scary. I think generally I feel positive and I'm an optimistic person. So I think that luckily for us, this is going to land in a way we're kind of in a rural community and uh, we can work sort of outside of the big crowds and, and get work done, thankfully. But so So think about this. People in third world countries, if they were listening to this right now, they would be nauseated to hear us even talk about these things because of the reality of their life and living on the edge all the time. No idea how they're going to feed their family tomorrow, much less next week. And they never have had, they never have known, mm -hmm. you know, and so they would have to be looking at, at those of us in the United States and Western Europe who have had it so good for so long and have had so many other things to fight about that had nothing to do with survival and saying, like, welcome to a pale representation of my world, right? We are definitely going to learn a lot. The whole country, each one of us is going to come out of this with a, a lot more information. And we'll look at disease. We'll look at the mm -hmm. flu. We'll look at personal preparedness. We'll look at probably our livelihoods and, yeah. and in just a completely different way. And it would be great if this kind of washed out over the summer and we look back and roll our eyes and think like, geez, calm down. It wasn't that bad. That would be great. But man, it's, it doesn't feel like, it's hard to know. It's hard it's to, hard it's to hard know. to know what it could look like. And at this point with, with some of these big, uh, you know, quarantine lockdowns, that's very real. So it is as real as real gets it's making it feel pretty serious. All right. Well, I don't know if this is helpful for anybody and uh, keep your chin up. Do your best to keep an open mind about the news and the reports and the facts and yeah. learn, pick them up as they go. If you have your mind made up on it, that's good. But I don't know. It seems like there's a lot of new information coming out. So let's let's let the new information land and, yeah. and maybe it'll we can adjust course. You know, certainty and wisdom don't often coexist. But here's the thing. We'll be back to our regular programming like in about eight hours. Like we've got a lot of videos coming out. I've this the spec house, the windows are ready to go in. Let me spoil a couple of things. Yeah. We're we're ready. The windows are in town, gonna be delivered to the job site day after tomorrow. They're gonna be installed. The zip system is going to be taped carefully. We're gonna be coming up with the siding, the trim's going on. And then we'll be inside. In the meantime, there's lots more content coming out of the blacksmith shop. And then we have a chance of saying some things with certainty and not being laughed at. So anyway, thanks. And, and one more comment. If you're watching this on our main channel, you're getting a look at our podcast setup. We film these and put them on our second channel, EC2, which, by the way, is where we're going to be putting new or experimental content. In other words... Stuff that we wouldn't maybe put on our main channel, like talking about camera gear. We've had to learn a lot about that. Um, we'll probably put that type of stuff on the second channel for those of you who are interested and and try to keep Essential Craftsman focused on the same stuff that it was from the beginning. We don't want to do any kind of switcheroo, but if you're interested in things outside of our normal topics, that would be a place to check out. Yep. So anyway, bat in the hatches, check on your neighbors. Don't be selfish and don't be scared. Just be smart. Okay. Well, with that, we're going to wrap this podcast up. Thanks for tuning in. Good luck. Well, well, in your situation, in your town, with your people, I really wish you all the best. Any last words? There's two things. In the Northern Hemisphere, spring is coming and I got to love that. And you may not be a praying person. I am. It is a good thing, especially in days like this. So I don't know how this has come across, but what I want to make sure you understand is that Nate and I are taking this seriously. We're not minimizing any of this. This is a kind of thing where I want to be part of a solution and not part of a problem. And I don't know how deadly this deadly virus is, but I don't want anybody to lose a loved one to this thing if I have anything to do about it. My people are keeping their head down. They're keeping their eyes open. Nobody's reacting in 
fear. We all are paying attention. And I hope you do the same thing. Keep your chin up. Keep your eyes open. God bless us, everyone. And keep up the good work. <laughs>